Praise God. Ah, oh, how exciting it is to be with you uh, today. And I'm glad that uh, Pastor Todd calls your church the Mount because I'd have problems pronouncing Arafat. So thank you very much. Uh, it makes it easy for me. Praise God. You know, just dumb it down for the chaplain. I appreciate that. Uh, I had a lady come up to me some time ago and she said, how old are you, chaplain? And I said to her, ma'am, I said, I'm retired military. That information is classified. I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you after I told you. She said, don't joke around. She said, I can guess how old you are. She said, just, just tell me a little bit about yourself. I said, well, I was a missionary to South America. She wrote that down very quickly. I pastored 11 churches in North and South Carolina. She wrote that down very quickly. I was a Navy chaplain for 27 years. Quickly, she was doing that. And I've been in the Senate for 16 years. She did that. I crossed the T. She says, I've got it. I knew it. You're 89 years old. Praise God. Praise God. So I want to thank Pastor Todd. I like his haircut, by the way. You know many of the true prophets. In fact, most of them were bald-headed. You didn't know that? Yeah, yeah. Praise God for that, you know. Remember Jonah, the gourd came out, burned the ball head, go up, thou ball head, go up, and you know, so praise God for that. So, uh, so it is a blessing and it is a thrill. Uh, I am here not because I am the chaplain of the United States Senate. I am here because praise is what I do. I tell you, I love to be in the house of God. I love to worship. That's my favorite thing to do. And I want to talk today about Winning with God's word. Winning with God's word. My mother was an amazing woman, uh, fourth grade education, daughter of a South Carolina sharecropper. She migrated to Baltimore, Maryland many, many years ago. And she had the wisdom to provide her children with a monetary motivation for memorizing scripture. And so this is way back. I would, I, I would tell you how far back, but it would frighten you, and you would think maybe he knows Abraham Lincoln. So I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you how back. But my mother would give us a nickel for every Bible verse we memorized, okay? So if you would enter my home in the inner city of Baltimore, Maryland, you would see then my four siblings and me searching the word of God for short verses, okay? We, we know every short verse in the Bible. If the verse is four words or less, I know it. I can tell you where it is. My favorite Bible verse is not John 3.16. It is John 11.35, Jesus wept. Powerful verse there. A powerful verse. It's absolutely amazing. My second favorite verse is Luke 17.32, remember Lot's wife. Wonderful word. Wonderful word from the Lord, you know. And 1 Thessalonians 5 is a treasure trove, you know. Despise not prophesying, you know. Quench not the spirit. Pray without ceasing. And so I was doing a riff on 1 Thessalonians 5, and my mother put me on a flat rate. She said, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. She said, I don't care how much you memorize, you can never get more than a quarter for the week, okay, because she give that that was the way she gave us our allowance, and she maxed out at a quarter. She was only making six dollars a day as a domestic. Well, I fell in love with the book of Proverbs for two reasons. One, Proverbs are short, but the second reason is I did not have a father in my home. I had a father. We all have fathers, but I didn't have him in my home. The rumor was he was a long-distance truck driver. That was the, his cover story. But he was so famous that they wrote a song about him in my neighborhood, and the song begins, it was the 3rd of September, that day I'll always remember. And the refrain is, Papa was a rolling stone. No, you all don't know that. That's uh, another thing. Song I only heard one time, Pastor. I only heard it once. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, believe that I got a bridge, but anyway. Um, so one day I was 13 years of age. I memorized Proverbs 110, got my nickel, 
My son, my son, if sinners entice thee, remember, always the King James Version with my mother, she said, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us, okay? My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. So here I am walking in the neighborhood. And two of my peers come and they say, hey, hey, Barrett, said, why don't you come with us and help us get back at somebody? And the words of that Bible verse reverberated in the corridors of my spirit. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And on the strength of that Bible verse, I said to these two young men, I'm not going with you sinners. You know, I was not the most, I was not the sharpest crayon in the box, but I, all sinners, I'm not going with you all. Well, I didn't know, but I actually had to Google it to get the dates and everything. I didn't know, but they not only got back at somebody, they killed somebody. And night after night on WBAL television, Channel 11, WMAR TV, Channel 2 in Baltimore, Maryland, the courtroom story was being told. And at the end, in fact, the guy who invited me at the end said, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, okay, you know. But they both received the same legal consequence, life in prison, right? which means if I had gone along with them, even if I had been standing there quoting scripture, I would have received the same penalty. And it is pretty difficult to become the chaplain of the United States Senate with murder on your resume. Okay. I said difficult because Moses had murder on his resume and God handpicked him at the burning bush. And David had murder. Uh, David had cold-blooded murder. You know, there's murder and there's cold-blooded murder. David, who had such a tender heart, the man after God's own heart, that he cut off a piece of Saul, King Saul's robe. Saul was chasing David like Lieutenant Gerard chased the Richard Kimball, okay? Some of you will get that on the way home. But anyway, okay, cut the robe. And he was weeping because I've cut the robe of the Lord's anointing. And yet he was able to give Uriah, one of his green beret, the note to General Joab essentially saying, kill Uriah. That's how cold-blooded it was. It was like Michael Corley. No, we're not going there. The Godfather part two, you know. Fredo, you are not. No, we're not going there. We're not going there. This is church, okay? okay? The word of God. I literally owe my life to God's word. You win with God's word. The greatest gift my mother ever gave my siblings and me was to create in us an appetite for the word of God early. I started memorizing scripture at age four. I had to compete with my older siblings, okay? All right? And that has been my safety net. It has been my analytical tool. The word of God is a great gift. I learned how to read because there was a Bible, and I knew I could get a big Snickers bar for five cents. I'm talking about the big one, okay? I could get the sugar daddy, okay? <laughs> and I was motivated to win with God's word. Now, why do, why do we win with God's word? We win with God's word, first of all, because God's word is truth. Pilate said to our Lord, what is truth? John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Can you finish it? Thy word is truth. If you are trying to debate with someone, the difference between critical and uncritical thinking is with critical thinking, you give reasons and evidence. Aristotle came up with something called syllogistic reasoning. Major premise, minor premise, conclusion. A premise is simply a reason. If a reason is 
a reason is either false or true, okay? okay? If it's false, the argument cannot be valid. You have a truth detector. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, and you will develop the reputation for being far smarter than you actually are because you have the word of God inside of you, and you don't have to know a lot of fancy Latin words, argument, ad hominem, quid pro quo. Well, no, no, we won't go there. You don't have to know all those things, okay? All you have to do is know is this reason consistent with the word of God? If it isn't, you already know that it's false. Then you can play Columbo, you know. Oh, just one more thing, sir. Just one more thing, okay? And you can ask questions. In the temple, in Luke chapter 2, when our blessed Lord at 12 years of age was in the temple, the Bible said he listened and asked questions. That is what the word of God, the truth of the word of God will do for you and make you a winner. David says in the 119th Psalm, verse 99, I have more wisdom than all of my teachers, my teachers, because I meditate upon your word. The word of God is truth. The second reason why you win with God's word is because the word of God is a guide. 119th Psalm, verse 105 your word is a lamp for my feet and a light <laughs> for my path. It is a godly positioning system, GPS. Now, when you're driving, and, and I'm a Navy man, but I am navigationally challenged, okay? Um, you know, you don't, my, the most frightening words when I ask for direction before GPS is what, and you can't miss it. I already knew. Oh, I'm, I'm doomed. I'm doomed now. Okay. My wife, you know, haven't we passed that drugstore before? You know, I just wanted to see it again. Okay. You know, you know, yeah. But, but, the, but then my children, one of the best gifts they ever gave me for a, a birthday present, gave me a Garmin, this was before they had them in the automobile, Garmin GPS. And suddenly I had more confidence than, I, I mean, I just had it going on. You could tell me the address and I'm just driving along. Oh, this is one, looking at the sights, pulling off for a scenic view. It was wonderful. Now, if human beings can create something that can guide you, and give you confidence and certitude that you are going to arrive at the right destination. Think of what a blessed privilege it is when you have eternity at stake. Anyone here wants to live forever? You have eternity at stake to have in God's word a lamp for your feet. Hallelujah. And a light for your path. The word of God will tell you whom you should marry. Okay? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And so I was dating a young lady in my freshman year, kind of a combination, Angela Bassett, Beyonce type. I don't know. Where did that come from? I don't know why those were names. And, and I, you know, I, I, I praise the Lord. I, I know the spirit of the Lord is leading. But then she told me, point blank range. You know, I'm not into religion at all. So if you're into this spiritual mumbo jumbo stuff and you believe, you know, that, 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 and that was the end of it. You know, I mean, it, it was the most painful decision I ever had to make. And I was, I started, I think that was the year I started singing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I mean, yeah, I started singing Negro spirituals, okay? But, 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 but you know, swing low, sweet cherry. Uh -huh. But the word of God was guiding me. And when we broke up, it was painful. I curled up in the fetal position in my dormitory room and cried myself to leave. Why? Why? It was bad. It was real bad. But then about two days later, I saw a young lady standing on the steps of Moran Hall. Scripture did not leap to my mind, but <laughs> the words of Christopher Marlowe, Ah, thou art 
fairer than the evening air, clad in the beauty of a thousand stars. That was my rap back in the day. It works, it works. Take notes, take notes. But the point is, I was guided by the word of God. And my wife and I have been married for 46 years. Okay. Because when God puts it together, he puts it until death do us part over. And it's sweeter now than it's ever been. Once you get the kids out, it's wonderful, 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 wonderful. They got something to look forward to. Okay. So God's word will guide you. Okay. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. We, we learn about this powerful word of God. For the word of God is alive. Hallelujah. <laughs> and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul. Okay. A Greek word, suke, which refers to your body and refers to the physical nature of human being, and spirit, the Greek word pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma, which refers to the fact that there is something in us that is cognitive, that reasons, that has God's stamp on us. You know, God has given us the ability to think and to reason and to Therefore, see beyond this world. And so it's, it's cutting between the soul and the spirit, between the joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The, 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 the King James Version says, it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the human heart. You do not so much search the scriptures as the Bible searches you like a heat-seeking missile. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom, my God, my God, we are accountable. Don't be afraid of accountability with human beings. They have no heaven to take you to, you know. No hell to keep you out of. You, you, you know that you are accountable to God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Fear means reverential awe for God. Reverence for God and keep his commandments. For this, I love this, is the whole duty of humanity. If you want to know what your whole duty is, have reverence for God and obey him. In fact, you demonstrate your faith by your obedience. And you please God with your obedience because it is an indicator that you really believe. Okay? And Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So how do we, why, how do we win with the word of God? We win with the word of God by remembering that the word of God is alive. Wow. The word of God is alive. It is quick. Okay. And the, for the word of God is quick. Okay. You heard of the quick and the dead. <laughs> okay. Quick means he's still alive. Okay. Dead means you didn't draw fast enough. The word of God is alive. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah 55, 11 says, God speaking, listen to this, my word will not return unto me void. But that's, that's a lot. But will accomplish the things whereunto I have sent it. God sends out his word and it will not return unto him void. In fact, Jesus is the word made flesh. The word of God is alive. That is why we need to be in the book every day. I tell people every day you eat physical food, Get a little spiritual food in you, 
Okay? If you only read a paragraph a day, slowly reflecting on what you're reading and talking to God about it, you would be amazed at what a transformative impact it would have on your life. You'd be amazed at the scriptures you would remember. The word of God is alive. But secondly, if you're going to win with the word of God, remember that the word of God is effective. It is not just alive quick, but it is powerful. It is effective. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 puts it this, puts it this way. All scripture is God breathed. All scripture. All 66 books. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the people of God may be totally equipped for all good works. Everything you need, you can receive from the word of God. The word of God is so effective that our Lord said in Matthew 4, 4, we do not live by pizza alone. That's what it says in the Greek. You got to know the Greek, the biblical language. No, no, no. We do not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of God is effective. When our blessed Lord was in the wilderness of temptation and the devil came to attack him, he defended himself by quoting scripture. If your life depended upon how, how much scripture you have inside of you, how well would you do? Okay? Would you just say, dead man walking, dead man walking? No, no. How well would you do? Our Lord said, it is written. And remember, the devil quotes scripture too. Okay? Jesus said, he said, in the Greek, it's since you are the son of God, first class condition grammatically. Since you are the son of God. You, you hungry? You're the son of God. Command these stones be made bread. And Jesus says, it is written, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That was, oh, so you've been to the mount, have you? Well, let me help you out a little bit. I quote a little scriptures too. Let me give you a little something. something. Why don't you come up here? Why don't you just jump off? See, because it, it, the Bible says he will give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. You see, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, rightly divide the word of truth. If you can rightly divide the word of truth, you can wrongly divide the word of truth. You have to know scripture enough to be able to respond when someone is twisting the word of God. Jesus came back and said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not put God to the test. It is effective. Jesus did not use syllogistic reasoning. Jesus did not use philosophical constructs. Jesus used Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It is the only weapon of offense in the armor that is talked about in Ephesians 6. You know, you know Ephesians 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, verse 12, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. And then it says, put on the whole armor of God, helmet of salvation. Now, that's just defense, keeping people from bashing your head in. Shield of faith, that just blocks the darts that they showed, the arrow that they showed. Shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, that helps you send the good news and be a good witness. But what is my weapon of offense? How do I frighten the devil? It is written. The word of God is effective. And I challenge you, if you have a particular uh, stronghold in your life, to get a Bible concordance, or you can just Google the, what the Bible says about and put the word in, and you'll get website after website after website, and start writing down some Bible verses on three-by-five cards and put them in your pocket and carry them around with you. And when you are tempted, pull them out 
and speak them. Proverbs 18, 21 says the power of life and death is in your tongue. I believe Jesus spoke audibly. I, I, he, 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 it is written, speak those words out loud and you will be amazed at the transformative power of the word of God that you will experience. God's word is effective. So God's word is alive. God's word is effective. God's word is penetrating. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the dividing asunder, the bone and marrow. It penetrates. In the parable of the four soils in Matthew chapter uh, 13, Jesus said a farmer was planting seeds, and the seed represents the word of God. And the seed penetrated the soil, but there were four kinds of soil. There was rocky soil, so hard the seed couldn't even penetrate. Wayside soil, yeah, where the seed would be trampled on or taken by birds. Thorny soil, where the seeds would germinate. It's all in Matthew chapter 13. But then the thorns would choke the seed. And in life, ladies and gentlemen, 75% of our efforts probably miss pay dirt. But when the seed of the word of God hit good soil, it brought forth, penetrated that soil 30 times as much, 60 times as much, and 100 times as much. That is how powerful the word of God is. I said in the previous service I did not want to be a preacher because every preacher I knew was financially challenged. And I told God I've had enough experiences up close and personal with financial challenges. But the word of God penetrated my heart, and though I ran from it. Word finally caught up with me and I became a minister. And I discovered Romans 8, 28, and everything God is working for the good of those who love him. I was afraid of being poor. Let me, let me, let me tell you something. The retirement check of a two-star admiral is pretty good, okay? <laughs> uh, you, you, you know, the, the salary for chaplain of the Senate is, is pretty good too, okay? God is, 84th Psalm verse 11 says, no good thing will God withhold from the upright. God is not going to let the devil... Uh, 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 reward his followers more than God rewards you and me. And God can give you stuff that the devil can't give you. Third, 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 third. Oh, yeah, he can give you stuff that the devil can't give you. Uh, third John 2 says, I would above all things, not that you just prosper, but that you be in health, even as your soul prospers. God can bless your family. God can put a hedge around your children and your grandchildren. The devil was so upset, he said, I can't even touch Job. You've got a hedge around him. Uh, 50, uh, uh, 50, um, Isaiah 57, 14 says, no weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. There is no way that the devil is going to compensate his followers more than God will compensate you. And I love the fifth Psalm, verse 12. The righteous are surrounded with the shield of God's favor. God will make people like you and they don't even know why. He will give you jobs you don't even have the background for. Favor. What it was, Daniel 1 verse 9, and God gave Daniel favor with the prince of the eunuchs. He was, he was Nebuchadnezzar, crazy Nebuchadnezzar's chief of staff, okay? He just liked him. Esther was in a beauty contest. Now, you know beauty is subjective, but God gave her favor, and the king couldn't take his eyes off of her, and God used her beauty to save her people from genocide. Remember, Haman had set them up, and Mordecai, Esther's uncle, said, if you don't go before the king and tell him about Haman's plot, we're all going to die. And Esther said, well, you know, 
The only time I can go before the king is if he stretches out his scepter when I come in. Otherwise, I die. If I walk in and he doesn't stretch out that scepter, I'm dead woman walking, okay? But I now love what Mordecai said to her, Pastor Todd. He said, if you don't go, look at this faith. Deliverance will come from another source. <laughs> but you and your people will perish. And who knows whether you will come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther walked in. She was so fine. The king couldn't even take his eyes off. He's reaching for, where is that scepter? I can't take my, oh, Lord, where is, oh, oh that is. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's how penetrating and powerful the word of God is. But most importantly, you win with the word of God because you find Jesus in the word. John 5, 39, my Lord said, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and these are they which testify of me. Wherever you go in scripture, there he is. The theme of the Bible is Jesus. There he is. In Genesis, he's shallow. In Exodus, he is the I am. In Numbers, he's the star and scepter. In Deuteronomy, he's the rock. In Joshua, he's captain of the Lord's host. In Job, he is the redeemer. I know that my redeemer lives, says Job. In Psalms, he is the great shepherd. In Proverbs, he is the beloved. Isaiah calls called him wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Zechariah called him the branch. Daniel said he's that fourth man in the fiery furnace. He came down to be with his posse. The theme of the Bible is Jesus. Micah said he is the one who's going forth of old is from everlasting to everlasting. Malachi said he's the messenger of the covenant. Matthew said savior. Mark said son of man. Luke said the great physician. John said the word made flesh. Acts said he is the one who will empower us to witness. Philippians says at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh yeah yeah. First Thessalonians says he is the one who will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise. Hebrews says he's the great high priest, touched with the feelings of my infirmities, in all points tempted like me, yet without sin. And John says I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I saw him high and lifted up. He is Alpha. He is Omega. He is beginning. He is ending. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. And so when folks tell me at Capitol Hill, Chaplain, why are you always so happy? When we ask you how you're doing, you'll either say I'm living the dream or I'm blessed by the best feel sorry for the rest trying to clean up the mess why are you so happy I tell him I'm happy because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name I don't know what name you're leaning on but on Christ. The solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand because you can't lose with the stuff I use because I win with the word of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 And so this is what I want to challenge you to do. Our blessed Lord said in John chapter 12, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. I want to challenge you for the next 
seven days to get you started to go to either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John and start with the uh, with Palm Sunday, our Lord coming into Jerusalem, and start reading slowly and talking to God for 15 minutes a day about the passion of Christ. If you lift him up in your life, if you lift him up in your heart, he will draw. Read until you see him abused by Caiaphas. Read him until you see him abused by Pilate and then Herod, then back to Pilate. Read, read the scriptures, that, that, that part, until you cry out with Isaac Watts, were the whole realm of nature mine. That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I want to pray for those who are willing to make commitment, starting at least for the next seven days. I'm going to, even if I have to do it during the commercials, okay, <laughs> with the remote, okay, I am going to begin to read slowly. The story of the passion of my Lord in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Or jump around if you want to. And the pastor gave a wonderful recommendation in the earlier services. He said, and when he works out, he has to get his workout clothes together, get his running shoes together, that kind of thing. Prepare that the night before so that when you get up, you're ready to get in the word. If you're willing to make that commitment, I want to pray a special prayer for you. And I'm going to ask you to stand if you're willing to make that commitment. I, that's something I do daily, but if you're willing to make that commitment, I want to win with the word of God, and I want to win enough for the next seven days and pushing beyond that if necessary, but for the next seven days, I'm making a commitment that I'm going to give God 15 minutes a day. You know, And I may have to turn off Victor Newman or whatever it may be, but I'm going to give him 15 minutes a day. <laughs> Praise God. What a beautiful sight. What a beautiful sight. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to do something as I pray. Just stretch as, a, as an act of faith. Just stretch your hand toward me as a, Lord, we're stretching our hands out today. And though they're stretching it toward the front, Lord, we're stretching our hands to you. We thank you for the power of your word of God. Quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword discerning our hearts. Thank you for this gift, Lord, that is our guide, that protects us, that gives us victory over sin. Now seal the commitments made here with the robe of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, while your heads are still bowed, there may be someone here who's never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. That's a critical part of having the Holy Spirit in your life because that is what you get when you receive him as Lord. You've never received Jesus into your life, but today you want to say, Jesus, I believe when you died on Calvary, you paid for all my sins. I accept that gift and I want to serve you for the rest of my life. If you've never prayed that prayer, but today you agree with it and you're praying it, would you just wave your hand? I've never prayed it, but I'm praying it today. And I want Jesus. Just wave your hand. Give him a wave of me. God bless you. Just wave it. Just wave it. And let, let the Lord, God bless you. Just wave it. Wave your hand. If you pray. God bless you. Just wave it. Wave your hand. Praise God. Just, 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 just wave it. Praise the Lord. If you wave it long enough, we'll put something in it. I see a lady, a sister in the aisle. Just, just, just wave it. And she'll put something in it in this area over here. Okay. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, yes, yes. Here's one. Oh, it's up. Just lift it. Father, we bless your holy name. Thank you for providing us with a weapon to fight the demonic. Thank you for empowering us to win with your sacred word. We pray this prayer in the name of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, our Savior and King. Amen and amen. God bless you. Give God a hand praise.